Before I start properly, I would like to thank Bob Smearfack for the recent shout-out. If any of you don't know who he is, he makes some excellent videos, very funny. Um, you'll find a link in the description box. Uh, do check him out and say hi from me. Um, I'd like to also welcome any new subscribers on board. Um, I haven't made a video for a, a wee while now. Um, I haven't been particularly well, but I'm pretty much back to normal. Um, I may talk about what happened there in a future video. Uh, we'll see how things go. Anyway, on to the main video. Many of the theists who comment on my videos seem to have a hard time understanding where I'm coming from when I describe myself as an agnostic atheist. I've attempted to clarify this before, but it rarely gets through to the young earth fundamentalists. So, as you can see from the title, I'm trying to use terminology which makes more sense to them. My target audience for this one is Ray Comfort and those who think like him. They seem to think that not only is their brand of Christianity the only correct one, but also that evolution is somehow in direct opposition to God. Note that they assume that their concept of God is the only correct one and that they rarely acknowledge the fact that the majority of Christians are not young earth creationists. People like Ray Comfort have a very poor idea of what evolution is. They claim to like science, but demonstrate that they don't understand scientific methodology, in particular the fact that science is built upon evidence as opposed to the supposed revelation of a supernatural being. According to the statements of faith on their websites, they believe that the Protestant Bible contains no errors whatsoever, and that if a scientist ever makes a claim that contradicts the way they interpret the Bible, then the scientist must be wrong. No effort is made by the young earth creationist to fact-check the claim in any sort of objective and honest way. Another thing I've noticed about these believers is that they take the Great Commission seriously, or at least they pretend to. According to their interpretation of the English translation of their book, they are supposed to spread the good news that we have somehow inherited the sin of the alleged first two human beings and that the God they believe is real holds a grudge against us and requires that we believe a story in which he apparently sent his son, who was also a third part of himself, down to the earth to reside in a human body for thirty-something years and who would behave impeccably as some sort of example of how we ought to behave. We are also required to believe that the religious people of the time regarded this Son of God as a heretical troublemaker who deserved to be killed. We are required to believe that the killing of Jesus somehow absolved us from the sins we supposedly inherited vicariously failure to believe the aforementioned story will result in us being tortured forever after we die. Personally I find most of that story impossible to believe. There's so much about it which makes little or no sense to me. But I digress. The point I wanted to make was that such Christians often refer to each other as being on fire for Christ or imbued with the Holy Spirit or some such thing. They frown upon what they call backsliders or lukewarm believers, as if a lack of certainty is a bad thing. Now I'd like to argue that being honest is a good thing. If a person isn't 100% sure about something, surely it's better to admit that than to go around saying that they are certain of it. As I've stated in other videos, I describe myself as an agnostic atheist. By this, I mean that I don't believe gods are real, but I'm not claiming to know this. I'm not claiming to be 100% certain of it. So the reason I'd like such believers as I've been describing to think of me as a lukewarm atheist is that it might help them to understand that many of us non-believers are not trying to argue that there is no God which is what most of them seem to think we do. If we're going to go down the road of trying to figure out if there is a God or not, we have to first come to an agreement about the definition of the God in question, as well as what exactly the supernatural is supposed to be. Despite years of asking believers what they believe and why, I'm still not clear on this. 
there are so many varied and contradictory claims made by the believers that it seems virtually impossible to nail it down. This doesn't bode well for the Great Commission. If the believers cannot agree among themselves on what exactly God is, how much or how little he intervenes in the modern world, how much or how little of the Bible is literally true, what exactly miracles are, which of the stories are parables, what faith is and how it works, and so on, then how is a naturally sceptical person like me supposed to be able to believe any of it? I can't force myself to believe that which seems implausible. But despite all this, I am open to the possibility that there might be something of value in religious teachings, even though I am reasonably certain that the gems of wisdom are hidden amongst a lot of dogmatic nonsense. For example, I can recognise that some of the teachings of Jesus, such as being kind to others, including those not within the tribe, are likely to lead to a better world, where people get along peacefully with each other. Whether Jesus was a real person or not is another matter. But according to other stories in what we call the New Testament, Jesus told people that he didn't come to bring peace. I feel sorry for believers who feel compelled to try to reconcile all of the contradictory teachings in the Bible into one coherent narrative. As a lukewarm atheist, I don't feel compelled to deconvert anyone. I've said it before, and I can't stress it enough, my argument is with the reality-denying fundamentalists not with those who have reached the conclusion that there must be a creator of some sort. Bloody hell, those birds are noisy. So although I think Ray Comfort and those who think like him are wrong about pretty much everything, it's their ignorance of and denial of evolution and cosmology which compels me to speak out, not least because they are teaching a bastardised version of science which closes minds and stifles curiosity. So if I can persuade at least one person to recognise that Ken Ham's teachings about science are wrong, and that Ken Miller's teachings about science are correct, then I will have achieved my goal. In other words, if a person's religiosity doesn't cause them to undermine science, then I'm happy to not interfere with their religious beliefs. I hope this will, in some way, help to build bridges between people who have reached a different conclusion about the God question.